Olha, vai ter festa em Olinda Livros contando histórias Pra guardar na memória A Fliporto que vem A porta em Olinda Muito interessante num evento desse porte Num evento desse tipo que está se discutindo é, Cultura é, Que a gente possa estar é, levando é, Várias tradições culturais E dentro de uma tradição antiga, uma tradição milenar, que é a, né, a tradição judaica, não se esqueça de estar trazendo também, puxando para cá, para o cenário, é uma tradição que está se começando a surgir agora, que é uma, já está fazendo parte da nossa cultura, que é a cultura digital. Né? Eu tenho o prazer de apresentar para vocês é, é Mark Derry, que é um dos é, pioneiros da discussão, da crítica dessa cultura digital. Né? Nós temos... É... O Mark Derry é um autor já de vários livros. Tá? Eu vou fazer uma pequena apresentação, vou fazer uma pequena leitura aqui do currículo do Mark Derry para vocês. O Mark Derry é um, é, já é um professor muito conhecido da comunidade acadêmica brasileira, no que se refere à cibercultura. E ele é um professor profundamente é, antenado, né, como a gente diz, com as questões é, referentes à, à cibercultura. Mas longe de ser uma, um defensor é, insofismável da cibercultura, ele é, um, antes de tudo, um crítico, alguém que pensa a cibercultura de maneira até bastante irônica, como vocês vão ver nos ensaios que compõem o livro que a gente está lançando aqui no Brasil agora. É, o Mark Derry é, ele é um dos mais influentes críticos da, dessa cultura, digital e ele tem os seguintes livros, né? The Pyrotechnic Insanitarium, American Culture on the Brink, Escape Velocity, Cyber Culture at the End of the Century, talvez seja o livro mais conhecido dele pelos pesquisadores brasileiros, e Flame Wars, The Discourse of Cyber Culture. Aqui no Brasil está lançando agora uma coletânea de ensaios que remontam desde 2003 mais ou menos até agora, 2009 para 2010, chamado uh, I Must Not Think Bad Thoughts, está sendo pela editora Sulina, e é uma coisa muito interessante em termos de é, cultura é, globalizada, porque esses artigos têm saído desde é, revistas de papel a revistas online, é, nos Estados Unidos, na Inglaterra, em vários países, e esse livro só está sendo publicado no Brasil, esse livro não está saindo nos Estados Unidos. O curioso é que agora, recentemente, no Twitter, é, o próprio Mark anunciou que estava vindo para cá e estaria lançando esse livro e já várias pessoas do Twitter se manifestaram dizendo que queremos ler esse livro em inglês também. Como assim esse livro não vai sair nos Estados Unidos? Né? Quer dizer, provavelmente ele vai sair nos Estados Unidos, mas é, o interessante da cultura é isso. Né? A gente tem essa mistura cultural que faz com que, de repente, determinadas culturas se interessem mais e mais rapidamente do que outras. Então, é, o Mark reuniu esse, esse conteúdo, esse conteúdo foi traduzido inclusive pelo Gunter Axt, que esteve aqui com a Camille Palha, na mesa é, anteontem, e é, agora ele vai falar para a gente um pouco sobre, um pouco sobre o, os temas desse livro, que são a discussão sobre a cultura digital, sobre o império americano né, e seu... Né, seu, 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 seu declínio, vamos dizer assim, suas, suas, suas incoerências, né? questões que vão desde 11 de setembro até a cultura do Facebook, por exemplo, e como a, as pessoas veem a si mesmas através do filtro da cibercultura, da cultura digital. Com vocês, então, eu passo né, a palavra ao Mark Derry. Mark, seja bem-vindo. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how many of you were here for Camille Paglia's lecture? Many people here, Camille Paglia? Yes, okay. A few of you. Um, she set the land speed record in speed talking uh, to the point where she left blisters on my ears. So uh, it was quite an accomplishment. I've literally never heard someone speak at a speed that would blister the tongue and the ear. Uh, I won't be speaking quite that quickly this morning, but hopefully I will be uh, every bit as informationally dense and rich in ideas. 
I've asked them to shut off the blowers, and if it becomes too hot, just wave your hands, because it's very noisy and very distracting. So we'll see if it becomes intolerably hot. Um, my lecture is actually called, I Must Not Think Bad Thoughts, Writing as Intellectual Insurgency. And it's a meditation on the radical politics of writing. I'd like to begin with a meditation, a bit of a personal essay on the time and the place that created me as a writer. And later in the essay, in the second section, I'll do a cultural critique of writing as a form of intellectual insurgency. I'd like to begin with a quote from George Orwell's famous essay, Why I Write. From a very early age, perhaps the age of five or six, I knew that when I grew up, I should be a writer. I knew that I had a facility with words and a power of facing unpleasant facts. Now I'd like to quote Ronald Reagan at the 1988 Republican National Convention, misquoting John Adams' observation that facts are stubborn things. Reagan famously said, facts are stupid things. And I'd like to quote the punk band X in their song, I Must Not Think Bad Thoughts. They sang, I must not think bad thoughts. I must not think bad thoughts, the facts we hate. Now in the early 80s, when I was studying English literature at a small private college in Los Angeles, the meth-cranked hit-and-run music of the punk rock band X was a shot straight into the cerebral cortex. X nailed the apolitical vacuity of the decade when greed was good and the grandfatherly velociraptor in the Oval Office, that is to say Ronald Reagan, mused on the TV show Good Morning America that, quote, people who are sleeping on the greats must surely be homeless by choice in this best of all possible worlds. X records like More Fun in the New World were F-bombs lobbed at Reagan's America, splitting the difference between eye-rolling irony and fuck you insouciance. But more immediately, they bottled Southern California malaise and alienation like some existential version of those joke cans labeled genuine Los Angeles smog that were sold in tourist traps. Out of tune, but existentially pitch perfect, the singers Exine Cervenka and John Doe of the band X keened over Billy Zoom's punkabilly guitar, harmonizing with the mood of LA youth culture. It was a mixture of suburban angst and political disaffection. Cervenka and Doe shared Orwell's facility with words and his power of quote unquote facing unpleasant facts, qualities evident in song titles by the band, such as The World's a Mess, It's in My Kiss, or Nausea, or Under the Big Black Sun, whose name alone makes it the theme song of Southern California Gothic. X was mood music for sitting in a frozen sea of cars in a rush hour traffic jam, watching one of the city's atom bomb sunsets through a sulfurous haze of smog or listening to a nightly news update on the latest freeway killer, or slam dancing in a crush of kids in nightclubs like the Whiskey or the Troubadour, swept up in a wave of sweat-slick, beer-sodden bodies that crested, then broke on the edge of the stage, or catching a fleeting glimpse from a passing car of the poltergeist glow of a TV in an empty room. The best thing about Los Angeles, says John Doe of the band X, in an unidentified documentary on YouTube, the best thing about Los Angeles is that everybody hates it. It's just a big, scummy place for people to come and try and do their business, you know? But I like the fact that Los Angeles is all confused and nobody really likes Los Angeles. 
They just put up with it. Actually, I liked Los Angeles for the same reasons John Doe did, all the wrong reasons. The blithe superficiality, the inexplicable angstlessness of the place that makes European emigres and East Coast intellectuals and New York neurotics like Woody Allen wonder if the city has undergone an existential lobotomy. It's a scientific fact, said Truman Capote, that if you stay in California, you lose one point of your IQ for every year that you stay there. And then right on cue, he dropped dead in Los Angeles, a stock irony scripted by some studio hack in the sky. But isn't that exactly what those of us whose foot-dragging ponderousness comes from overthinking everything need? A meaningectomy, a surgical removal of meaning to buy us some lightness of being. No matter what you do in LA, your behavior is appropriate for the city, writes the urban theorist Jeff Maynard. Los Angeles has no assumed correct mode of use. You can have fake breasts and drive a Ford Mustang, or you can grow a beard and weigh 300 pounds and read Christian science fiction novels. Either way, you're fine. That's just how it works in LA. You'll see Al Pacino sitting right beside you in a traffic jam, wearing a stocking cap. You'll see Cameron Diaz in the checkout line at the supermarket Whole Foods, giggling through a mask of reptilian, surgically altered skin. You'll see Harry Shearer buying bulk shrimp. The whole thing is ridiculous. The whole city is ridiculous. It's the most ridiculous city in the world. But everyone who lives there knows that. No one thinks that LA works. No one thinks that LA is normal. No one thinks that LA is well designed or that it's functional in any sane sense of the word or even that it makes sense to have put it there in the middle of a freaking desert in the first place. They just think it's interesting and they have fun there. Like the X record says, more fun in the new world. Now, what does it mean to become LALian? Well, when I lived there in the early 80s going to school, becoming LALian means crunching your popcorn contentedly as Los Angeles is obliterated by a nuclear bomb in Terminator 2. And while you're crunching your popcorn and wondering if you're all out of juji fruits, suddenly remembering that Walter Benjamin line about mankind's self-alienation having reached the point where we can experience our own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. And embracing the tragedy of that quote as farce, a Disney dark ride for the terminally ironic. LA is the apocalypse, writes Jeff Maynard. It's you and a bunch of parking lots. No one's going to save you. No one's looking out for you. It's the only city I know where that's the explicit social contract in living there. Los Angeles is the confrontation with the void. Better yet, it is the void. It's a confrontation with the oceanic, with anonymity, with desert time, with endless parking lots. Now, in his book, City of Courts, Excavating the Future of Los Angeles, the Marxist historian Mike Davis casts a cold eye on the French philosopher king Jean Baudrillard and his perverse exhilaration in his book America at what he calls the delivery from depth that Los Angeles makes philosophically possible. In America, Baudrillard famously rhapsodizes about the city's Tron-like geometries of light seen at night from an airplane window, a sort of a sci-fi incarnation for Baudrillard of the information galaxies of postmodernity. Mike Davis reads Baudrillard's panegyric, his poem to Los Angeles as the decentered centrifugal city par excellence, rejoicing in its delirious depth depthlessness. Mike Davis reads that reading of Baudrillard as a quote, a, a 
string of guidepost cliches for the benefit of postmodernism's club med, a kind of a dissertation-ready collection of one-liners from the de Tocqueville of the 30-second soundbite, delivered at a safe remove from the everyday political and social realities of the city. Now, true, too many of Baudrillard's drive-by aperçus sound ahistorical and apolitical to the Marxist ear, but his shock and awe at the luminous, geometric, incandescent, incandescent immensity of Los Angeles, I think, makes perfect sense. Only if we think of it as Burke's essay on the sublime, repurposed as the voiceover for the beginning of the movie Blade Runner. Then it starts to make sense. And Baudrillard's perverse exhilaration at the thought of escaping the dead weight of meaning needs no explaining if, like countless other Americans before you, you move to LA to reimagine yourself as someone without a past, maybe even without a personality, a kind of an android, a kind of a cyborg, irradiating your history in the nuclear flash of the city's desert light, purging your memories in the infinite emptiness of the Pacific Ocean. Here, beneath that immense bleached sky, is where we run out of continent, wrote the Sacramento homegirl Joan Didion in her famous essay, Notes of a Native Daughter. But she also spoke elsewhere in another one of her essays about the freeway experience, the sensation of driving in the Ballardian cloverleafs and swooping flyovers of Los Angeles, where the freeway is almost a pharaonic monument, one of the great wonders of the world. She talks about that freeway experience as what she calls a kind of a Zen meditation on cruise control, a concentration so intense as to seem a kind of narcosis, a rapture of the freeway. The mind goes clean, she writes. The rhythm takes over. And she quotes the urbanist Rainer Bonham from his famous book, The Four Ecologies of Los Angeles. Bonham says, as you acquire the special skills involved, the Los Angeles freeways become a special way of being alive, a state of heightened awareness that some locals find almost mystical. So what? if we run out of continent, I ask. Just floor it, launching yourself right off a freeway overpass, into space, or better yet, into the sea, right off the Pacific Coast Highway. Go for the Hollywood apotheosis. Become one with the spectacular crashes you've seen in a million movies, fireball wipeouts prepping you for this, your last split second of truth. We're desperate by X, blasting out of the car speakers as you hurtle in slow motion into tabloid Andy Warholian media myth. And the X song plays as you pinwheel in a fireball into the Pacific Ocean. Coca-Cola and a Motorola kitchen, Naga hide and a tie-dyed t-shirt. Last night, everything broke. We're desperate, get used to it. We're desperate, get used to it. It's kiss or kill. So that, at least, was my state of mind in the early 80s when I was going to school in Los Angeles, trying to reconcile the fossil literature that I was reading as an English major with my late night struggle to find a use, however perverse or obscure, for what I thought might be a facility with words, as Orwell put it, and my attempts to acquire the writerly skill of what Orwell called facing unpleasant facts. The clash between the cultural irrelevance of my college curriculum as an English major and the sun-soaked dystopia all around me the alternative futures of post-apocalyptic sci-fi leaking into the time-space coordinates of everyday life in 80s LA was jarring, to say the least. Now, at some point during the
a long march through the dream of the mood and the fairy queen and the metaphysical poets and all the other fossil literature we were required to trudge through as English majors. At some point, uh, I raised my hand to ask, why weren't we reading, say, William S. Burroughs's Naked Lunch? Because after all, it was written by one of the Beats and hadn't they sort of insinuated themselves into the canon? After all, Naked Lunch was written the year I was born, in 1959. And in 1982, English curricula across America still had not caught up with it. No one dared to teach Naked Lunch in 1982. The answer, as my professor patiently explained, was that only an academic with a career death wish would be rash enough to include in his course readings a text that hadn't yet been rendered safe for classroom dissection by historical distance and scholarly embalming. Now right about then, it occurred to me that part of a writer's job description must be thinking bad thoughts, by which I mean wandering footloose through the mind's labyrinths, following the thread of any idea that lures you on, even if it turns out to be wound around a minotaur's finger. Any idea, arcane or depraved, obscene or blasphemous, patently impractical, preposterous on its face, untouchably controversial, irreducibly complex. The ethos of thinking bad thoughts isn't synonymous with the willful perversity, ideologically speaking, of Christopher Hitchens or H.L. Mencken's lifelong devotion to spit-roasting the sacred cows of the bourgeoisie. Nor is it synonymous with the nothing is true, everything is permitted, libertinism of William Burroughs or the liberatory cynicism of punk rockers like X. But it does contain a tincture, a little bit of the essence of each. Thinking bad thoughts is above all else a refusal to recognize intellectual no-fly zones. And in America, that translates as the rejection of our bread-in-the-bone puritanism, our bourgeois anxieties about taste, our unprotesting submission to muzzles for the mind. By muzzles for the mind, I mean the self-censoring vigilance against thought crime, routinely practiced by academics, fearful of offending tenure committees, and blinkered by elite assumptions about what constitutes serious subject matter or scholarly style. By Hollywood and the news media, phobic of controversial or challenging content that might scare off advertisers or upset middle America's mental digestion. By the faux populist demagogues attacking heads, evangelical know-nothings, and Tea Party lumpen on the anti-intellectual right, and by the thought police on the Stalinist left, scouring every soul for counter-revolutionary tendencies, the ineradicable pockets of racism, sexism, sizeism, ageism, ableism, and lookism lurking in even the most ideologically pure of heart. So thinking bad thoughts is an intellectual insurgency against the friendly fascisms of the right and the left who are, at the end of the day, happy bedfellows in their prohibition on pain of death of wrong thinking. Allow me to offer an exhibit. Exhibit A, Andrea Dworkin, standard bearer of the penis is a weapon, intercourse is rape, school of feminist thought, who ended up shoulder to shoulder with the religious right in her fatwa against porn and all its works and ways. This is the unshakable conviction that while some beliefs may be ethically indefensible or morally repugnant or factually inaccurate, thinking bad thoughts as an intellectual ethos teaches that no subject should be ruled out of bounds, no thought forbidden, 
intellectual freedom is unimaginable without the right to think the unthinkable. So, that really is the point of my work, to cast a critical eye on the accepted order of things, to read between the lines of the world around us, considered as an ideological text, in short, to think bad thoughts, and to inspire you, my reader, to do so as well. Uh, a kind of a Marxist economic determinist analysis now of our historical moment, at least in the US, and I suspect this is at least partly true in Brazil as well. Um, the landscape in which the writer as a cultural actor does what he does is becoming more and more irradiated, more and more economically radioactive in America, and the ability to make your uh, living by scratching out thoughts on paper is becoming more and more difficult for a whole complex of reasons having to do both with market forces and cultural dynamics. So in his essay, The Long Goodbye, trying to see past the increasing, uh, increasingly harrowing flight of long form nonfiction in general interest magazines, quite a mouthful as a title, uh, the author Lawrence Weschler writes, the magazine universe today is increasingly niche slotted, paint driven, attention squeezed. There may be more magazines than ever before, but commercial forces appear to be enforcing an ever more frantic fragmentation of the readerly market. So for example, Weschler says, surfers and advertisers interested in reaching surfers may have a half a dozen magazine venues to choose from, but the reader is much less likely to find a beautiful extended surfing rhapsody exposed to a general audience uh, simply because the writer had a gloriously quirky passion and wanted to write a long form, non-fiction, rhapsodic, half poetic, half factual piece about it. That sort of piece, Lawrence Rushler says, is dying out. It's becoming part of the fossil record. Readers, after all, he argues, bore so easily nowadays. Or at any rate, editors seem convinced that they do. Or maybe it's just that the editors, squeezed by increasingly convulsive demands on their own time, can no longer themselves sustain such leisurely spans of attention. The unspoken goal in too much American public intellectualism is not to tell people what they don't know or what they never even imagined they might want to know, but to tell people what they already know. Since it logically follows that anything they don't know is too weird to survive in what we Americans in our intimately, inimitably, irony-free way like to call the marketplace of ideas. So it's this failure of editorial nerve, I believe, driven by a kind of a cringing fear of scaring off advertisers that has rendered largely extinct the sort of narrative nonfiction that Weschler describes as, quote, pieces you might curl up in on an evening, having no prior notion that you could even become remotely interested in the subject of that piece, and yet through the sheer narrative energy of the writing, you find yourself becoming caught and then held, completely immersed, lost to the world for hours at a time. That sort of piece is becoming more and more rare for some of the reasons that I just delineated. And it's also canon law. It's also uh, part of the iron logic of the marketplace in American media that you must tell people not only things they already know, but you must do it in the language they already use. The PowerPoint prose of Malcolm Gladwell, easily bulletized in the mind of an overstressed, anxious middle manager in first class, reading the book that all the other anxious, overstressed middle managers are reading that year. 
Like William F. Buckley, I personally, as a writer, had never scrupled at sending my reader to the Oxford English Dictionary if a sesquipedalian word was the best word for the job. Nor have I felt any obligation to smilingly submit to the intellectual straitjacket that constrains too much journalism, namely the presumption that a writer's allusions and references historically and culturally and theoretically, critically, should be circumscribed, should be bounded by the cultural literacy of Kim Kardashian. Between the covers of my new book, I Must Not Think Bad Thoughts, are meditations on, for example, Facebook as a limbo of the lost for the twittering dead from your high school yearbook, or robot spam considered as surrealist poetry, or the semiotics of the suicide note, or the uncanny seductions of anatomical venuses in Florence's La Specola Museum, 18th century obstetric mannequins made out of wax. There are essays on the homoerotic fan fiction of Star Trek magazines that fantasize about the Borg, the fascist hive mind of man machines, as S&M votaries in a pleasure dungeon. There are essays on the SUV as a totem of ugly Americanism, or the morality of wearing chemo-themed fashion during wartime, or the theme parking of the Holocaust, or the church of euthanasia, or Santa's secret kinship with Satan or the sadism of dentists, the severed head as a semiotic signifier, the sexual symbolism of Madonna's big toe. The writings in this collection are animated by the naive belief that ideas matter. The intellectual activism can, in its own small way, the voice of God speaks. Okay, um, the writings in this collection are animated by the naive belief that ideas matter, that intellectual activism can, in its own small way, be an engine of change. My work is not explicitly political in the manifesto making to the barricades, fist thumping sense of the word, but my brand of cultural critique is nonetheless shot through with a rage for social justice. I'm aghast at the abuse of human rights and the erosion of civil liberties during Bush Jr.'s reign of error made manifest in the Patriot Act, or the infiltration and covert surveillance in America of anti-war groups, or the extrajudicial incarceration of enemy aliens, and the blithe embrace of torture by some Americans stampeded wall-eyed with fear into a moral sewer. I'm horrified by the apocalyptic blowback brought on by America's disastrous, disastrously misguided foreign policy and by the nasty, brutish nature of our times. The soul-sickening video clips of terrorists yelling, God is great, without a hint of irony, while decapitating an American hostage and the nauseating snapshots from Abu Ghraib of an American GI parading a naked Iraqi on a leash. I'm nauseated by the angry white lumpen on the Tea Party right, muttering darkly about sedition and rough justice at the end of a gun barrel, and by the rioting Islamist mobs vowing death to the infidel cartoonist at the Danish newspaper who dared to mock the prophet Muhammad. Humor, apparently, is the first casualty of the clash of civilizations. And I'm troubled by the Mansonite sociopaths on America's evangelical fringe gunning down abortion doctors in the name of the unborn. Again, the situational irony is lost in them. I write against these things. The ruling class's war on the vanishing middle class and on the working poor, and on the swelling ranks of the homeless. Tax relief for the super rich, the defunding of public education, the downsizing of social services, the grotesque 
bloat of the prison industry, the upspike in federal incarceries, thanks to ever more draconian sentencing laws. But at the same time, the ethos of thinking bad thoughts makes me as weary, as Walter Benjamin might have said, of the politicization of aesthetics as I am weary of the aestheticization of politics. So, as someone thinking in public and writing in public, I take up my pen against fundamentalisms of every stripe, from the religious rights fatwa against secular humanism, to the neo-common jihad against progressive thought, to the new age war on reason, to the suffocating sanctimonies of the academic left, to the free market neoliberal homilies of Ayn Randian libertarians on the right. The Walter Benjamin in me is forever trying to make peace with my inner Georges Bataille. Aesthetically, like the Surrealists, I believe in the revolution of the mind, in spelunking, cave exploring the unconscious. I'm committed to the politics of political incorrectness, thinking the unthinkable, speaking the unspeakable, bad thoughts that outrage the mind police at both ends of the ideological spectrum, right or left, whether the pitchfork and Bible brigade on the flat earth far right or the dissent stifling Stalinists on the Andrea Dworkinite far left. I stand with the Roman playwright Terence, famous for his observation, I am human and nothing human is alien to me. And I stand with artists like the photographer Joel Peter Witkin, well known for his grotesque tableau, who once recruited models with an ad that he addressed to physical prodigies of all kinds, such as, and I quote, pre-op transsexuals, bearded women, contortionists, erotic, women with one breast in the center, anyone with a parasitic twin, living cyclopes, people with tails, women whose faces are covered with hair and are willing to pose in evening gowns, people with complete rubber wardrobes, people who live as comic book heroes, anyone claiming to be God. God. That was a list of the models he wanted for his photos, and I stand with that sensibility because like them, I'm secret, the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, but only when considered as surrealist literature, pirate utopias, vast necropolises, objects removed from people's stomachs, semiotics, the far fringes of theoretical physics, sacred monsters of fetal teratology, necromancy, nostalgia, time travel, ships trapped in frozen oceans, Mexican masked wrestlers, Mainly animals, Derivian hauntology, doll hospitals, fetishists, eccentrics, hysterics, obsessives, religious lunatics, kitsch, camp, bad taste, the sublime, the profane, the gothic, the grotesque, the carnivalesque, the unspeakable, the unthinkable. These are just a few of my favorite things. In short, dear reader, I want you to to think bad thoughts. I want to induce in you the vertigo that comes from gazing too long and too deeply into the cultural abyss, and then I want to give you a loving shelf right over the edge. Thank you. alguns minutos ainda, temos perguntas para o do, do auditório, opa, maravilha eu vou começar fazendo uma, uma ou duas perguntas para o Derry e já temos perguntas aqui do, do auditório ah, ah, eu vou fazer as perguntas em inglês mesmo vou traduzir algumas, algumas já tem até já estão até escritas em inglês mesmo ah, ah, Mark ah, I noticed that uh, in your your style, uh, uh, you are very 
uh, tunes to uh, J.G. Ballard, but also it seemed to me that uh, the quality of your text reminds me very much of William Burroughs, and, and perhaps a little bit of William Gibson, especially in, the, in his latest works. Are you uh, any, in any way related to them? Do you, do you feel a, a kind of kinship to them? It's a marvelous question, and there are many possible angles of attack you could take on a question like that. But as you speak, uh, one angle of attack that occurs to me immediately, and there's probably a doctoral dissertation lurking in this thesis, is that both William Burroughs, uh, the author of Naked Lunch, as I mentioned in my essay, and also J.G. Ballard, were trained as doctors. Ballard actually studied to become a psychoanalyst in London, but in order to do that, shortly after World War II, he had to take general anatomy, gross anatomy classes. Burroughs afflicted briefly with a career in medicine, uh, and he realized that while he was fascinated by the lurid, multicolor illustrations in textbooks, Victorian textbooks, on unspeakable epidermal pathologies, on diseases, he didn't actually like human beings that much. He was fascinated by disease, but he detested patients as whining pill scroungers. But the point I'm making is that both Ballard and Burroughs wrote a very antiseptic, clinical, uh, anatomous prose in which, in the tradition of, say, Jonathan Swift, they are anatomizing culture, social, satirically. And I think it's really the, the contrast, the sharp juxtaposition between the antiseptic, surgical glint, the sort of shiny clink of the scalpel and the forceps of their writing. It's the contrast between that and the gothic or grotesque subject matter that each of them treats that makes their work so powerful. I don't believe that I come within spitting distance of either of them, although it's very flattering of you to say that, but that's certainly a style I aspire to as a writer. Uh, uh, Burroughs very often compares himself to a, to a reptile because of his former used a drug addict history. Was he that a uh, uh, reptilian eye very cold stare at things. Uh, uh, do you think that's, that's the right approach to things, uh, to stare at things coldly? Well, it's really interesting you bring that up because in cultural studies these days, in cultural theory, one of the really hothouse vivariums or one of the cottage industries, one of the bleeding edge discourses that is most exciting is animal studies. And Donna Haraway, the cultural theorist and post-structuralist feminist, who's always a kind of a canary in a coal mine, she's always a, about five minutes in advance of the trajectory of most academic thought. She has moved from technoculture studies, with which she was previously associated, uh, most notably in her cyborg manifesto. Uh, she has moved from that to an analysis of what she calls companion species, thinking about zoos, thinking about pets, and what she's really doing is interrogating or deconstructing in a kind of a Derridian way the anthropocentric worldview. And she's looking at the liminal spaces in the age of xenotransplants and the age of transgenic engineering. She's looking at the growingly permeable membrane between the human and the non-human, between uh, articulate primates like ourselves and the kingdom of the beasts. And one of the most fascinating developments in contemporary cultural theory is the way in which each historical claim for human exceptionalism, whether it's Homo Ludens defining ourselves as man the playing animal, Homo Faber, man the tool using animal, Homo Logos, men who manipulate symbols, each one of those is under assault by the far fringes of cognitive ethology, which is to say the science of animal intelligence and animal emotion. It seems that each day's headlines bring news of animals who are able to do what we thought of as previously uniquely human. So I think Burroughs actually is using the animal in more of a grotesque, 
Rabelaisian or Swiftian style as an image of the unspeakably, irretrievably utter, other. And what I would argue is that more and more we see that the animal is not so much other, not so much a narcissistic mirror for reflecting our anthropocentric view of things, but that we have more and more in common with animals than we ever imagined. Okay. Speaking of this cyber manifesto, uh, I have a one, uh, the first, our first question uh, from the audience. It's not a question, but a, f a call to arms. Uh, it says, take the chance. The governor is the exterminator. Blast it. Blast LA. I think you should keep it as a memento. <laughs> Marvelous. Thank you. I'll hide this when I pass through Homeland Security, though. <laughs> you should keep it safe. Uh, oh, the, the second is really a question. Um, how do you see the uh, impact, the positive and or negative impacts of cyber culture in the uh, peripheral countries, in the geopolitics of the world power? Um, well, that's almost an impossibly broad and unanswerably vague question. I appreciate the political angle of attack that's inherent in the question. I'm not quite sure to do what to do with it since it is so generalized, nor would I be arrogant enough to presume a knowledge of the geopolitical landscapes of the entire world. Um, but I will say that um, there's a fascinating phenomenon happening now, um, which is that we live in an age of very peculiar binary oppositions. So, in one sense, Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian media theorist of the 1960s, uh, was writer than he ever knew. And in many ways, in a plethora of ways, he was more wrong than he could ever have imagined. And the way this relates to geopolitics, in my opinion, is this. Uh, everyone remembers the McLuhan comment, we live in a global village, and McLuhan talked about uh, the all-at-onceness of what he called the wraparound sensorium, that is to say, the sort of virtual bubble that encases us in a world where things are ever more mediated. And McLuhan predicted that that would result in a profoundly immersive interrelationship, that all of humanity would be knit together in kind of a global family. And he used a photograph of an African shaman entertaining his village in front of a dancing campfire, the leaping flames, as a kind of an emblem of his romantic kind of Arcadian, Rousseauian vision of humanity returning to a kind of a tribal social landscape. Um, the problem with this is that while we have the illusion that we are aware of everything happening in the world informationally, there's also a kind of an affectless electronic autism that accompanies this. So yes, we know second by second uh, what's happening with the merest uh, sort of earthquake tremors in Santiago, Chile, as people are twittering about this even as it happens. We know the instant a woman has been gunned down by guards in Tehran, Iran in the middle of a mass protest and so forth. So we have this sense of almost instantaneous information transmission. However, more and more the world is mediated by flickering ghostly apparitions on screens. We live more and more in the symbolic realm. And all of human history can be seen as articulate, symbol-manipulating primates desire to live inside their thought balloons and to untether the thought balloon from the thinker so that it tears loose from any moorings in material reality, sensory impression, social fact, or historical contingency, and floats away into the realm of the purely virtual. So I think what we're seeing is a, a greater and more instantaneous informational involvement in the geopolitical landscapes of the world, but a distancing. Social commentators talk about empathy burnout. How many plagues can you feel compassionately about? How many earthquakes 
destroying the wretched of the earth in the third world can you write a compassionate check for and send your care package. And so your nerve endings end up cauterized by the sheer tsunami deluge of human tragedy that, by the by, is of course escalating in the age of strange weather as global warming accelerates the ecology of fear and these environmental cataclysms, which for a whole host of reasons have the most profound impact on the most wretchedly poor areas in the first world, gazing at the geopolitical landscape through our flickering screens, we are more and more aware and less and less caring, less and less involved, I believe. So McLuhan, in that sense, was both right and wrong, I think. Uh, um, I will ask you uh, a few more questions, but uh, I would like to point out one thing that we were we were talking about uh, a couple of days ago. It's uh, one of your uh, abilities. Uh, I think uh, that's a very, very good one, uh, which I like very much, is the ability of reading against the grain. Uh, you can take uh, another like Ballard or like Foucault and reading in another, uh, right, uh, another angle. Uh, could, could, you, could you enlighten the audience a little bit more uh, on that, to talk about a little, little, little more on that, because I have a, a right right after that, I'll have a question that fits perfectly on that position of yours. Okay. Um, I'll try to parapsychologically anticipate the question. You can hold it up to my forehead like a okay. spiritualist and I'll try to guess, what, <laughs> guess what's in the question. Okay. Um, well, so the question is, um, if I understand it correctly, is, um, how does my writing write against the grain, or perhaps what is the utility of writing against the grain for writers? Um, and this is actually a marvelously timely question because all of the old structuralist and even post-structuralist notions of what Roland Barth called writing against the grain, that is to say, uh, a very writerly approach to texts in the Barthesian sense, meaning um, perverse or subversive or merely idiosyncratically self-serving interpretations of text, uh, which used to be merely the dream of the renegade or guerrilla semiotician, in the sense that Umberto Eco talked about in his marvelous essay towards a semiological guerrilla warfare. Umberto Eco predicted that the armchair in front of the television is the new combat zone is the new military theater, and the war being fought in a media age is the war for interpretation of mass media texts, a contest of narratives, as postmodern theorists call it, a struggle for control of the story. And you see this in the political arena where the instant there's a news event, pundits from the left and right engage in the mass arena in a kind of a battle of words struggling for control of the meaning of this news event. But what makes this literary critical and critical theoretical concept so timely is that now in the age of the mashup and the fan video, in the age of recombinant media, do-it-yourself media, guerrilla media, pirate media, ordinary people are able to fulfill Roland Barthes' dream of reading against the grain. So for example, have any of you seen the Brokeback Mountain parodies on YouTube? Yeah? There's a huge uh, subterranean black lagoon of satirical parodies of mass culture text. So no sooner does a movie come out than people cut up the trailer and do a kind of a gene splice or if you will a meme splice using kind of the recombinant, ad hocist, deconstructionist, Barosian cut-up logic of pop culture that is facilitated now by digital media. Because as you well know, when something becomes digital, it, can, it becomes instantly and endlessly manipulable and replicable, right? So for example, there's an extraordinary video on YouTube which you must see, and it's called Scary Mary and it reimagines Mary Poppins as a profoundly uncanny, absolutely horrifying 
chiller movie in the Hitchcockian tradition. And by carefully selecting split second images and sequences from the film, they create a trailer for a movie that never existed, irretrievably terrifying. Conversely, another version of the same idea is the trailer for a version of The Shining by Stanley Kubrick as a heartwarming family comedy, a romantic comedy about a charming boy named Danny and his loving father, right? And so um, these are great examples in pop culture of reading against the grain, right? Uh, Mashups in music are another example of this when they are animated by something resembling a political consciousness, and I use that in the broadest sense of the term, as opposed to being purely formal deconstructionist uh, sort of studies in manipulation. There's also, also another great example in the, in the sci-fi pop culture. Uh, there was a recently a very edited a trailer of Star Wars in which uh, Luke and Leia are kissing and then Han Solo are looking quizzically at them. Right. Because, come on, it's, that's incest. Right. But there's not even in the plot in the beginning to start with. But that's, uh, it was done right after the fact. So it was another massive, uh, major hardest and exploding experience. And, and if I might just respond to the point you made very briefly, um, a lot of these cut up or deconstructed texts, uh, specifically on YouTube in the form of fan videos, are a really fascinating kind of historically unprecedented phenomenon, which is the sort of fondly ironic or affectionately contemptuous tribute to a beloved pop culture text. So it's very oxymoronic, it's very paradoxical, it's a real conundrum. They're both satirizing the text, whether it's Star Trek or Star Wars or Brokeback Mountain or The Dark Knight or Sin City or whatever it is, but they're also uh, paying homage to something that they love. And one thing that I find very instructive is it's been kind of a part, uh, an act of prestidigitation or conjuring or parlor magic in popular culture for cultural critics for the longest time to reveal the hidden subtext lurking in popular culture. This is what cultural critics have had, sort of had a monopoly on for much of the 20th century, uh, is exploiting the difference between what Freud called the manifest and the latent content of the dream, right? Well, if commercial culture, if popular culture in a marketplace society and capitalist mass culture uh, is the sort of extruded unconscious of the public mind, then a big part of what cultural critics do is sort of expose the supposedly hidden subtexts of things. And often this takes the form of revealing a sort of gay imagery or homoerotic impulses flickering beneath the surface of the sort of Batman-like hardened carapace of American masculinity. Or another example is the whole folklore, the whole popular conspiracy theory of what in America um, it is called subliminal seduction. This idea that advertisements are swarming with hidden or subliminal messages, death's heads etched into ice cubes in uh, Bacardi ads, naked women concealed in the camel on the packet of camel cigarettes and so forth. This is part of the whole folk paranoid folklore of sort of mass culture as a Freudian conspiracy. But what's really interesting is that now that monopoly on that interpretive strategy has been poached upon by masses so that ordinary folks can do their own kind of guerrilla semiotic deconstructionist analysis. And a lot of these parody and tribute videos on YouTube, as you pointed out, take the form of sort of queering, as they say in queer theory, homoeroticizing, humorless, hyperbolic masculinity. And one of the most hilarious examples of this is uh, how many of you know the movie 300? Based on the Frank Miller graphic novel, okay? 
So it's a crypto-fascist recruiting tool for the American military, right? I mean, no, no secret there, you know. And uh, you know, the decadent Persians ruled by this 300-foot-tall transsexual drag queen, multiply pierced, right? Uh, sort of RuPaul, RuPaul on steroids, or Lady Gaga's idea of the friendly giant, right? I must, I must remind you, he was, he was a Brazilian actor, in the way. Okay, right. <laughs> Did you uh, you cite uh, Freud, polymorph perversion, fetishism? Uh, uh, this uh, psychoanalysis uh, is part of uh, the ethics of thinking bad thoughts. What's your in personal interest in psychoanalysis? Uh, well, I'll try to be brief because you've been an extraordinarily patient, indulgent audience, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate your attention and your patience through my very, very lengthy essay and my even more long-winded and circular remarks here. Um, so I will try to be uncharacteristically pithy, and I'll simply say two things. Um, Fabio, a moment ago, you asked about reading against the grain, and I'd like to elaborate a little bit on that, and I will answer your question about Freudian psychology and psychology more generally in a roundabout way by saying this, that um, there's now emerging on the fringes of cultural theory a very fascinating uh, sort of small phenomenon, a micro phenomenon, which is kind of two-headed. On the one hand, it's known as architectural fiction, and on the other hand, it's known as applied, applied Ballardian uh, thought, or applied Ballardianism, from J.G. Ballard, the British uh, visionary British science fiction author I've mentioned so many times in the past hour. Uh, these are sort of a two-headed beast or a conjoined twin, but they're not actually completely synonymous. So what is architectural fiction? Well. Some of the most extraordinary architecture of the late 20th century and early 21st century has never been built. Uh, Rem, Rem Koolhaas's, some of his most amazing designs, uh, some of the most incredible architects, such as Archigram, the science fictional architecture collective in London in the 1960s, or, for example, Constant, the situationist architect, have these delirious hallucinatory visions. Constant wanted to build a building that would cover the surf, the entire surface of the earth and uh, facilitate the situationist flaneur as he moved on his derive, his movement through the mongrel metropolis, through uh, clouds of crowds in search of uh, indulgences and fantasies and pleasure endlessly. So architecture has always used fantasy. It's used models, it's used illustrations, it's used narratives, and now science fiction authors have read against the brain. They've said, instead of considering these things as plans for buildings which will almost certainly never be built, you know, Archer Graham fantasized about walking buildings, giant buildings on stilts, like something out of the wild, wild west, or War of the Worlds, or the At-Ats in Star Wars, that when you're tired of living somewhere, your house rises up on legs and walks stilt-like across the environment. Well, science fiction authors have said, this is really a form of science fiction. What you're doing is speculative fiction. So let's just call it a new genre of sci-fi. And so that's what architecture fiction is. And now, architects are starting to write science fiction, but it's post-human science fiction, embracing a new post-human psychological model, which is, as Ballard says in his introduction to his novel, Crash, most novels presume the bounded, centered, closed, coherent ego of the Victorian patrofamilias in the 19th century. This doesn't really accord with the world we live in, where our egos are decentered and centrifugal. They're spun off their axis. That's why you have all these postmodern theories about Deleuze and Guattari's body without organs. post is talking about boundary dissolution, right, or anti-eatable psychology. And so in architecture fiction, there are irradiated, depopulated landscapes, and the stars of the narratives are buildings, not people. So that's an example of kind of reading against the grain. 
and I think it's really an extraordinary phenomenon. And then the other example is applied Ballardianism, which turns that paradigm inside out. It looks at J.G. Ballard novels, which are all about interpreting the post-human landscape we live in and looking at architecture as machines. Architecture machines for lathing into shape new sorts of subjectivities, new sorts of identities. So Ballard was the, one of the first novelists to say, how are we becoming different, living in landscapes of multi-story parking garages, clover leaves, freeway flyovers, traffic islands, gated communities, office parks, theme parked, strip malls, and so forth. Ballard writes a fiction in which the real star is the built environment and the landscape of media fictions. And so applied Ballardianism reads Ballard not primarily as a science fiction author, but as a postmodern philosopher like Don DeLillo or David Foster Wallace, whose real utility isn't their fictional narratives, but it's their deeply cogent, trenchant, uh, almost gnomic philosophical aperçus or little insights about the landscape we live in. And similarly, back to your question about Freud, and then I'll wrap it all up. Um, I like to say that my favorite postmodern philosophers are Don DeLillo and J.G. Ballard, and uh, my favorite Gothic novelists are Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud. Because what they're really doing, they were immersed in the Victorian penny dreadfuls and Gothic fiction of their day. And from Freud's Wolfman to his Rat Man to the whole shining like haunted hotel of the Freudian ego with its ravening unconscious chained in the basement, what they're really doing is writing a Gothic fiction about capital dripping blood, about specters stalking Europe, about the vampiric upper classes battening on the wretched of the earth. It's great stuff. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Mark. Thank so, you. Thank much. you. Thank 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 you. Thank